Fine. You are listening to Mediation Station, and this is your host, Greg Fenton. Each week, we explore topics and ideas related to the experience of people with conflict and look to promote the profession of conflict resolvers. We are available to connect with at greggf at primus.ca and at 647-227-4734. Visit us at our Facebook page to like us and Facebook group page to become a member. Also visit YouTube channel, Fenton Mediation. Listen to podcasts of Mediation Station on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. Please follow us at our Twitter account, which is at Fenton Mediation for the program. Our topic for conversation today is called Mediation. Keep decision-making in your court and that Robert Besunder is here for conversation momentarily. A uh, couple things to share first. I want to share about an article, or really a blog post, that is titled Mediator Selection Skills More Often Important Than Expertise. So, this is from January 20th, 2021, and it's uh, written by two guys, lawyers, slash mediators, I believe, Eric Goss- Gossen and S- Stephen Hearn. So, according to one of the rules, 24 of the Ontario Rules of Civil Procedure, certain court proceedings in Ontario are subject to mandatory mediation. Even if it's not mandatory in a particular proceeding, mediation is a form of alternate dispute resolution that parties may want to consider to avoid a full trial, reduce the cost of litigation, and hopefully arrive at a settlement that is agreeable to everyone involved. Whether or not a mediation is successful is, in large part, dependent on the choice of mediator. When choosing a mediator, parties tend to focus on the mediator's expertise. They want to find someone knowledgeable in the subject matter of the case. There is no doubt that such expertise can be helpful. However, for a mediation to truly be successful, the mediator must also have a certain skill set. The mediator must be able to listen understand the party's concerns, and identify the party's interests, even if they are not obvious on the surface. Consider, for example, that disputes can be emotionally driven. A good mediator should be able to sense and identify underlying issues, such as the desire of one of the parties to reconcile or receive an apology from the other, and then facilitate that. Time and again, these skills prove to be much more important in a mediator than subject matter expertise. Moreover, these skills apply to all types of mediation, including commercial disputes. In fact, it is in a commercial dispute that a mediator may be more likely to overlook the emotional component or other underlying issues, which may not be as obvious as they are in family or estate related matters. A skilled mediator will always go beyond a strict reading of the law and leverage the unique set of facts as well as the uncertainty and expense of a trial to bring the parties to a mutually agreeable resolution. So that's the article. I thought it was like something to open up and broach. So just lay, let me lay out some of the logistics for tonight. We're continuing with uh, presenting the program live each Sunday night from 8 to 9 p.m. through Zoom due to the radio station, CHHA, 1610 AM, needing to adhere to COVID-19 emergency measures with having no live in-person programming. We will engage in conversation with everyone attending, able to listen and watch the conversation. Microphones and webcams will be closed. And if anyone wants to contribute anything, there are two options. One is to see the chat icon as a bubble at the bottom center of your screen for you to click to then type in a comment or question and click to send. That will be shared out loud as part of the conversation. Or you can click on the reactions icon that is also on the bottom center of your screen for us to see. Click on the hand icon within there. For us to see, you wanna speak and we will then open your microphone for you to speak to share your comment or question and we will engage in conversation on that. The show is being recorded for both video and audio purposes that will be uploaded for public access on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts to listen to 
once the shows are edited. And just to note, the video of, of the four earlier shows that have been done through Zoom have now been edited and uploaded to Fenton Mediation for your viewing pleasure. So make sure to get a bag of popcorn or something. They're each about an hour and a bit and um, go from there. So I want to welcome Robert for being here tonight. And you're Thanks looking for having me dapper, man. Very dapper? good. Yeah, dapper. I think that's the first time anyone's used that word to describe me. Well, I always like to be unique. Well, and, and in any event, the other words we can't repeat. Yeah, this is a, uh, yeah. yeah. Because I, I do have the setting on the YouTube that it's, it's able to be for children to listen to. Well, I'll, I'll try to keep my, my uh, discussion tonight at that level as well. And I see there's also someone else who's visually um, accessible. That's the uh, person named Joan, or actually her name is Elfie. Yeah. Welcome, Elfie. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Yes, appreciate you stepping in and, uh, you know, being here with us. So tonight we're going to have a conversation on mediation. Keep decision making in your court. Focus through Robert, complimented by Elfie. And then uh, whatever else I do is part of the conversation to help support it. So thanks for coming, Robert. As I mentioned, this is your first visit yes. with me officially. Yes. Um, and how about you share some information about your professional journey? It's an accidental journey. Uh, started in the 1980s. Um, instead of pursuing my dream, I, I pursued a practical course, which was a university education, which my background led me into a specific profession that needed no prerequisites, uh, law, because uh, I had an English degree before law. So law is, was really the only professional faculty that would take me. Uh, and I happened to like it uh, after I started. And I fell into litigation accidentally. Um, when I was looking for an articling job, I went to the job boards at the uh, Law Society and applied to a whole bunch of jobs and took one thinking it was a general practice firm. Turned out all they did was car accidents. So I spent the next 30 years of my life pretty much doing car accident cases on both sides uh, for insurance companies and for injured claimants. So I'm, you know, professional journey, primarily a litigator. Um, around 15, 16 years ago, 16 years ago, one of my mentors at my old law firm was a small claims court judge, part-time, and it sort of got me interested in the area. And I had a superior court judge tell me at a hearing afterwards, it was just the two of us talking. He asked me if I ever thought of applying to the bench. And it brought back a lot of memories of gym class in high school when I spent a lot of time on the bench. And um, I thought, I'm familiar with it, and sure. So I applied to become a small claims court judge, and lo and behold, uh, March of 2006, I was appointed in Central East Region up in Richmond Hill, Newmarket, Oshawa, and I've been doing that ever since on a part-time basis. Mm -hmm. And then six years ago, I decided to open up a mediation practice because I had attended dozens, if not 100 or 150 private mediations as a lawyer, and lawyers having the egos that everyone believes they have, I thought, I can do this too. So I tried my hand at mediation, and after a year, I signed up to take some training um, and to be accredited by the ADR Institute of Ontario. Um, so I'm now what they call a QMED, a qualified mediator. And I've been mediating for the last six years, primarily personal injury insurance disputes. And well, that's all consistent because you said that you fell into this profession. Every, everything I've done has not been, well, the mediation I did by choice. And same with the judging, but 
None of that would have come about had I not ended up at the firm I was at, had I not accidentally become a lawyer. Um, and the moral of the story is whatever route you follow, you can make the best of it, even if it isn't what your original dream was. Um, can I say that really it's about creating our pathways rather than following a pathway? That, that, that's a good way of putting it. And you also find that you it's like filtering things out. You start with a coarse filter and you keep going with finer filters as you go down. And eventually you get a very pure substance. And I think that's what aging does to us. So I started out as this very naive 20 year old with a thousand different dreams. And over time you filter out who you really are. And I can't say with any certainty, I am a judge, I am a lawyer, I'm a mediator. Um, but I think the mediation is closer to who I am than the lawyering. And the judging is closer to who I am than the lawyering. Uh, but it's a good background. You can't be a judge without being a lawyer. So it was a necessary prerequisite. And it teaches you, I think every time you take on a different mm -hmm. role, you learn a little bit more about how other people see the process. Um, the notion of not judging a person till you've walked a mile in their shoes. So I've walked in a couple of different sets of shoes and uh, gives, I think it gives you perspective. Doesn't make I think, you smarter. I, I think the common, common perspective for all these different uh, dynamics of professional practice are working with people who are going through some form of struggle. Absolutely. And I had a discussion with someone the other day who is a healthcare professional. Um, and I said, you know, look, from my perspective, I have always seen law as a healing profession. It's not a commercial enterprise. People don't come to see a litigation lawyer generally saying, I've had a wonderful day. I'm happy. I've got a lot of money in my pocket. My health is great. My family is lovely. I'd like to start a lawsuit. Uh, the vast majority of people who come, in, come through your door are hurting in some way. They've got a dispute, whether it's with an insurance company, whether it's with a supplier who hasn't paid them, whether it's with a spouse and they're divorcing. Someone is going through some kind of hardship, something where they need to be made whole. And in that sense, looking at law as a way of helping people to heal uh, it's, it's a lot more satisfying than just looking at it as dollars and cents. Well, the thing is, how many lawyers, and not with a particular number, how many lawyers in a general manner are receptive or responsive to someone wanting to share that kind of affect of their lived experience, their feelings? How many lawyers will be open to having that kind of engagement or conversation in well, general? Well, most will put on the face that they're open to it. But look, I, I don't want to badmouth the profession. There are some wonderful, wonderful lawyers who do this work for very noble and very right reasons. But like with any profession, uh, you can say the same of doctors. There are wonderful doctors who really went into the field because of the money and not because they had this burning desire to make the world healthy. Uh, it doesn't make them any less of a technician or a practitioner. Um, and I'm not about to start judging people's souls, but it's the same with lawyers. There are lawyers who entered the field because of this notion that it could be lucrative. And then there are those who, when they hear these problems, genuinely care um, and are genuinely affected by it. And open up that space, that opportunity for having those kinds of conversations. Uh, yeah. that, that, that's what I you know, hearing from you, and we'll have more that you're going to share with us as we go through the balance of the show, that you're going to talk about somewhat your relational aspect, that you see people as human beings, you're empathic in some way, your self-awareness, your reflection, complemented with your past practice, your education, your training as a lawyer, and how that has migrated into your transition as a mediator. Well, look, the, the one thing I always like to be clear about with clients and also when I'm sitting in small claims court as the judge and people come in and they see you with the robes and this sash across your chest and there's this notion that you're something other. And I like to disabuse people of that notion. 
a judge, a lawyer, a mediator. We are exactly the same as the people we serve. And that includes the negative qualities. There are times with the best of us as mediators, lawyers, deputy judges in small claims court, Supreme Court of Canada justices, I'm sure, where the people in front of you are not necessarily likable people. There are, pe there are people out there who come to court, come to dispute resolution with absolutely improper motives, impure thoughts, whatever you wanna call it. And you look at them and you don't necessarily like them. The, and that's not important. What, what is important is you have to respect people and treat everyone, even the reprehensible people of the world, with the same level of respect because they are participants in a process. And the process fails if you start playing favorites, whether you're a judge, mediator, or lawyer. So yeah, the, and, and that's the whole notion of criminal lawyers who defend Nazi war criminals. You may not like them, but it's part of a process and you have to keep the integrity of the process by showing the same respect for a person, whether you like them or not, whether they're being honest or not. Well, you know, in, in the justice system and the, the legal profession, that works through a lens of judgment. Mm -hmm. So it's about positions, right and wrong, sides, blame. Mm -hmm. Whereas in mediation, it's an open-ended process, tends to be, yes. from my experience. Non-judgmental is a, a term we use and apply and value within the process. How do you navigate the uh, two domains? Uh, you don't always successfully. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I liked what the excerpt you read from that article at the beginning of the show, um, because the whole notion of subject matter expertise ties in with this because, you know, on an insurance dispute, and, and this was part of the ego. And when I started out mediating, thinking I can do this because you've done something long enough. You think I know the area. I can evaluate any case that comes in front of me. You have the subject matter expertise. And it's hard then to separate yourself from your role as a mediator. When you, you get these briefs in front of you, you've got all the paper, you read it. And instinctively, you know what the right outcome should be from a legal perspective. And then you have to turn off that switch in your head that says lawyer, advocate, giving advice, and say, that's not for me. I know how much it should be worth. And maybe that will assist me in guiding the parties when they're swimming sort of aimlessly. Um, but you really have, you have to turn that part of your brain off and realize you're not the one being paid to give advice and evaluate. Um, so how do you navigate that? You you do more mediations and you get better with each one because there's no hard and fast answer saying that you can learn that skill. You can be taught what you have to do, but doing it, it it's the same as growing up in North America and moving to England and learning to drive on the left side of the road. Um, so how, how would you define your approach to mediation? I got you, Alfie, I'll be with you shortly. Yeah. I, well, let's use the buzzwords. There's evaluative mediation and there's facilitative. And I try to walk a line between the two because the people who hire me by and large are hiring me not because I have this 30 year track record of mediating every type of dispute under the sun and I'm known as the mediator's mediator. Uh, the vast majority of people who hire me as a mediator do it because they know me from the industry and they know that I have subject matter expertise and I'm not going to, I'm not going to disappoint them by coming in and saying, I'm a complete blank slate. Oh, insurance, please explain what is insurance to me. Um, I'm not a complete neutral in that respect. And they know that I've read the materials and that I am walking that line being evaluative but also facilitative. Uh, and I think my reputation, if I have one, hopefully is that even though I am possessing some subject matter expertise, and I'll, I'll take away the word expertise, we'll call it knowledge. Um, expertise is for someone else to judge. Even though I come into mediation with a fair bit of experience and knowledge, I still stick to the process and I still feel that people expressing 
their not just positions, but their interests is important. Um, personal injury and insurance is, you know, the word personal is a misnomer. It's personal to one person only, the person who's been injured in an accident. To everyone else, it's business. And it becomes a commercial mediation. And everyone is talking about money while some poor soul is sitting there probably wishing they could put their neck brace on because it still hurts them five years after the accident. So it's a commercial enterprise. Everyone's dealing with dollars and cents and they want the subject matter knowledge. And you have this one individual who really is often kept silent. Who and also is the prime reason you're doing the process in the first place. Absolutely. But for that person, we wouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. And yet the vast majority of mediations in that area, and I, I speak from experience as a lawyer, seeing how other mediators have mediated those disputes, the injured party usually just sits there. We could have gotten an animatronic plaintiff to sit there and it would have had the same value. And it's only when you start getting offers being exchanged back and forth, and as a mediator, you don't see this, in some room, a plaintiff's lawyer and their client are discussing what the plaintiff's lawyer is suggesting is the right number to put forward. And as a mediator, you don't always hear the voice of, of the injured party. I, well, try, it, I try to get that out, though. I mean, it, it, it sounds like a lot of the traditional model or format is constructed in a way to be a negotiation based on ultimately money yeah. rather than a template of, okay, you're a person, you've been injured in this car accident. Help us understand, share with us what that's like for you. What happened? That's not necessarily the story or the, that's not incorporated into the process. So I want to give an opportunity for uh, Elfie. You wanted to say something before. Yes, I wanted to say um, that I've observed Robert in a number of um, um, personal injury mediations and even participated a little bit with them. And I, I wanted to shine a little light on um, the evaluative manner in which Robert um, mediates. And, you know, being a very kind of facilitative person myself, I, I haven't really before Robert, I, I didn't really have the respect I should have had for evaluative type mediation. But what I see is that um, he speaks the lingo. They know his background. They know what that he knows his way around that whole system. You could say there's a particular culture to it. Yeah. And, and he has the credibility to make the process work because the participants in the mediation know he knows what's going on, know he knows what, you know, what's a reasonable settlement and, and what isn't. And they, they put their trust in him because they know he knows what he's talking about. And so I, I think that there's really something to be said for having that subject matter knowledge, if you want to call it that, and for the participants to know that, that you have that knowledge and expertise. You have the expertise. But it's dangerous to have that knowledge. And the danger is that you, the wording you used about people putting trust in me, and you ha always have to be mindful that you're not the lawyer, you're not the client, you are not a decision maker in any way, shape, or form. And even though you know the parties might be honing in on $75,000, and in my heart of hearts, I know the case isn't worth more than 50. But if they want to go to 75, they go to 75. And you have to always keep you know, banging. Be, be self-aware of yeah. your role, your responsibilities, the expectation on you, and of the process and how you yeah. organize that. And yeah, me and mediator should be issued a, a, you know, a blunt object to keep beating it into their heads that you are not the decision maker. 
Because when you cross that line, you lose credibility and you run the risk of mis misdirecting people. Um, right. Well, let's, bro let's broach some of the concepts. In mediation, they talk so much about voluntary. What does that mean relative to also in, in the court or the justice system approach? Well, being involved in all, all different aspects, including the adjudicative role when I'm in small claims court, I know that when people come in front of me in court, from their perspective, they've probably been told, when you go in front of a judge, all bets are off. Um, and really, the, the other thing that comes off beyond, beyond the bets is control. When you are in front of a judge, you can control the words, the documents, the images that you present to the court, whether it's a judge or a jury, you have that level of control. But once it's out of your mouth, once the paper is in front of someone else, and once you have stopped speaking, whether it's as a lawyer or a litigant, you lose all ability to control the outcome. And I, I can tell you, um, I, I make no secret of it when, I, I'm, when I'm in front of people in court, I tell them, take a look at this face. Do you trust this face to make a decision? And I say, I walked off the street the same as you. This is the first time I've ever had to deal with a furnace case. I live in an apartment. I don't own a furnace. So you're trusting a guy who doesn't own a furnace to make a decision about a furnace, who's never dealt with a contractor to make a decision about a contractor who's never driven standard transmission to tell you that the mechanic who was working on your tr transmission did A, B, C, and D. I said, I don't like those odds, even as the judge. And yeah, and you're referencing the, you know, the variety of circumstances that are filed yeah. as claims that come before you. And that's not voluntary. Party decision making. And it isn't voluntary as a judge because I don't get to choose the cases. And it's not voluntary as a party because you don't get to choose the judge. You don't get to pick a judge with subject matter expertise. And you also don't get to choose a judge who you think might be smarter than your average, uh, you know, eight, eight legged sea creature. And that a lot of people, when they look at the judge making a decision, look at the judge and say, what rock did that judge crawl out from under? Because he or she didn't get it. They didn't get this case. And guess what? That's called being human. And it's so, and the judge's role, we talk about voluntary in, in the court system. Yeah. The judge's role is to adjudicate or make a decision when the parties can't on their own. That's right. And you, you don't choose anything other than the initial choice of saying, I'm going to sue someone. And then if you're on the other side saying, I'm going to choose not to settle it at the beginning, I'm going to choose to defend it. That's the last bit of voluntariness in the system. You get a little, you know, it's like being on the highway in the express lanes. It's, you can't get off until you see the next exit to the collectors. And it's the same in court. You get occasional ramps that you can exit, but for the most part, you're in this express lane. Mediation, on the other hand, mm -hmm. voluntary. I have a dispute. I've got a problem. I'm going to choose not to put my fate in the hands of a third party. That's a big choice. It's saying, I'm gonna choose my fate and I will need some help getting from point A to point B. So I'm gonna get a mediator in there to help with the process. Choice of a mediator, that's voluntary. Because if you want mediator X and the other side wants mediator Y, there ain't a choice of mediator. Um, you Then sometimes if you both want mediation, end up losing some voluntariness by maybe going to a third party to pick the mediator. But by and large, choosing mediator is voluntary. And then once you're in the process, it doesn't matter how badly the process is going, how well it's going, everyone's got exit ramps. The offer is made for $70,000, you want 90, it never comes close to 90, you get off the ramp and it's the end of the process. You don't have to settle family law. You're trying to divide up who gets this dog, who gets that cat. If you go to mediation and you reach a point where, oh, my ex is going to get the cat, I wanted the cat. If it's not agreeable to you, if it's not voluntary for you, you always have that option of walking out of the process. 
No one has a gun to your head. No one says, this is how it's going to be at the end. And that's, it's very empowering. It's also very frightening for a person to have to make their own decisions. And you, you see in mediation, time and time again, people appear indecisive because they're not used to being given that voluntariness of making their own decisions. Which is, you know, a power. power decision making, from my point of view, is a power. I want to bring to light a question that's been put in the chat. Sure. Do the majority of people that choose a value of mediation expect that it will include an assessment of the strengths and weaknesses on the part of the party's case? Uh, when do you decide to remain neutral in the process? Uh, well, I start every mediation by saying, I'm going to keep my mouth shut unless you ask. That, and I tell them, I have my own ideas about what the case is about. And that's, you know, occupational hazard. You can't work in the field for three plus decades and not have a, an opinion. But I say, I'll keep my mouth shut. You, you didn't ask me for my opinion. You asked me to mediate. And if you ask me, I'll tell you. But then I always say, and take what I say with a grain of salt, because I've only lived with this file for a short period of time everyone else has had it for a much longer period of time. So I don't give my evaluation unless I'm specifically asked. And if I am asked, I give a thousand and one caveats about, look, here's what I think the strengths are, here's where I think the weaknesses are, but you know the case better than I do. All I can do is give you my perspective on it. And this, is you, this is you as counsel for the person no, you're representing? You, this is, is me as mediator. mediator. Um, okay. So, so I, would you I, share this kind of information in a joint session or, or not? Usually not. Um, now, sometimes it's helpful in a joint session if there is a the proverbial elephant in the room and you know that people are going to be derailed within 30 seconds of caucusing in a mediation. It's sometimes helpful to address that elephant in the room and say, look, I was looking at this and there appears to be a limitation period issue. The claim was filed two years too late. I see it's been addressed in the briefs. Is there any consensus on how you're going to deal with this? Because you're going forward with this. So I'll sometimes raise my concerns or my opinions by asking questions. So it's not so much me imposing my view, but a lot of it is, and I hate to say it, it's playing dumb. Well, you, you also, though, know that you are perceived and maybe at times understood to be the authority in the room. Yes. You do influence the creation of the process and the facilitation of the process by what you do, what you don't do, how you do it, and how you don't do it also. Absolutely. And, you know, as counsel, when I used to attend mediations, I would never know what was going on in the other room when the mediator was talking to the other side. And I always wondered what magic powers does that mediator have that suddenly got an extra $30,000 for me to give to my client. And now I see what those magic powers are. And I only know the magic powers I use and they're not magic powers. They're having a good open, frank discussion with people and seeing what their comfort levels are, what their interests are, where they would like to see the process going and exploring that with them and seeing if they're willing to be bold enough to make a gesture in favor of that. Well, I think a lot of times it's, uh, it's about really acknowledging the individuals who are involved mm -hmm. as to their lived experiences for mm -hmm. them to have a sense of, quote, comfort to some level some trust within the process, thus with the, the mediator, that third person that's organizing that process so that they can then say, okay, some of the expectations are not necessarily what I got myself all stressed up about. Mm -hmm. And now I can better hear what the other person is saying. And then I can be more open to sharing my perspective so that we can move from positions, uh, which is my interest, your interest, so we can move to a more collaborative opportunity of our interests. Well, exactly. And the other thing is when you're having those kinds of movement talks with 
the participants learning what they're saying and being able to echo it back and acknowledge and trying to get them to move or to act on those interests and what do you believe will help advance the process. Look, you can't be a fool when you're mediating. You have to realize that pride, ego, uh, not losing face, all of those things play a role in what you hear from people. So sometimes to get people to talk openly, you do have to do a bit of ego stroking. You do have to play on a, an individual's personality. And you know, there will be lawyers who think the world of themselves. There will be lawyers who have absolutely no sense of ego and really are truly focused on the interests of their client. You deal with them differently, but it's all about the same thing, getting them to put trust in you, that you are a safe place where they can put their ideas, interests, um, fears, that you're a safe place that they can share that with you. And when they do share that with you, then you can, using whatever tools you have as a mediator, um, and sometimes it's just common sense, sometimes it's just dumb luck. Um, or I'd say, hey, it's a matter of being self-aware and yeah. using the empathy that helps people to appreciate that you value their lived experience, though you're not taking ownership for what they've lived through. Absolutely. And people can tell when you're not being sincere, or, or at least that's my naive view of the world that they can tell. And so if you go into a mediation and you're doing it for all the wrong reasons as a mediator, I think that will come through eventually, no matter how good your skills are. Uh, and empath empathy and, and authenticity are really good tools in in any dispute resolution process so with regard to your personality so this is another question in the chat evaluative or facilitative which is best suited to your personality with your background foundationally as a lawyer judge or justice of the peace or that kind of domain that um, kind of judge. which is best suited to you I think, I think my personality always tends toward evaluative. And I have to be very self-aware by saying, do I have an ego? Absolutely. Do I let it get in the way of the process? I don't think I do, but I do know that deep down, I have a, a degree of confidence in what I'm doing uh, that comes from 30 years plus of doing it and being very serious about what I've done that evaluative comes very naturally to me because I look at problems and I say, look, even as a first or second year lawyer, even before mediation was the norm as a process, I always looked at these things and said, this is, this is silly. If two mature lawyers are handling this case, one on each side, can't we figure out a resolution? Why do we need to spend thousands of thousands of dollars just to let some stranger, a judge, or a jury make the decision, can't we figure it out ourselves? And I still believe that. But when you're mediating, you have to take that step back and say, yeah, I think I'm mature and experienced, etc. And I know what the right answer is. Um, I've, I've got enough confidence and maybe ego that evaluative comes very naturally to me. And facilitative is a lot harder and that, that's where the training as a mediator came in, because I didn't know the first thing about facilitative versus evaluative, those terms of art, until I took uh, mediation training. And all of a sudden, it's not going to change who you are, and it's not going to change how you mediate, but it gives you a lot more self-awareness to know that, yeah, deep down, I'm evaluative. I got to shut that little bit off every so often, keep that part silent and maybe pay lip service to the process um, because well, the, pro the process really does work. Even if you have no subject matter expertise, the process will work in many, many cases. Um, but, but I also find the subject matter expertise and being evaluative comes in handy when you get to those really tough moments and you need a credibility that goes beyond process. You need the credibility that says, look, I've walked 10,000 miles in your shoes and I know exactly what's going to happen. That kind of credibility um, sometimes is priceless. So the evaluative has a role. Well, then how, how do you navigate 
with the evaluative, which is my experience, settlement oriented, settlement focused. Let's get it. Okay, this is going on. Reality check. Okay, this is what's most likely to happen in some form. Mm -hmm. If you don't decide here, this is what the potential outcome, like settlement conferences are presented in that manner, where it's about decision making. So the evaluative, where it seems to be somewhat taking a greater role to influence the decision making of those who have the decision making authority or power relative to mediation, where in a facilitative, it's giving that ownership or providing that space all for the parties to make that determination. Absolutely. And in, in facilitative, you never, I don't think you ever really feel like you've got some kind of consequence in your back pocket. And when you're doing evaluative, I think everyone is aware because they've hired you because you have the ability to be evaluative. I think everyone's afraid of that moment where the mediator might chime in and you try to navigate around that. And it's, it's almost like in the back of my pocket, I've got the answer. And don't, don't push me to the point where I actually have to open up my mouth and let, let my words influence the process. And I don't think I've had more in the last six years, probably not more than one or two mediations where I've actually had to think about reaching into the back pocket. Um, because a lot of the ones I do, quite frankly, it doesn't matter how evaluative or how facilitative I am, they're not going to settle. And that's just the nature of this industry. There's a certain percentage of cases where the payor comes with no intent of paying anything and the recipient will not give up their case. So if it's zero versus 100 and there's no middle ground in the eyes of anyone, and there's nothing you can do to convince them otherwise. What am I going to do? And, and we're, 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 we're talking, if my information is understanding this right, and my experience yeah. is, that we're talking in the civil process, yes. in personal injury domain of mediation practice. Yes. Relative to other domains of mediation, like family mediation. Yeah, look, family, the family is the same thing too, in the sense that you will have the scorched earth approach by a spouse. And I've seen that. I've lived it in one or two cases. I've acted as counsel where money is no object and we will take this to the end of trial, even if we lose, just to put the other side in the frame of mind of thinking, should I or shouldn't I? And that's, that's inequality of bargaining power at its most explicit. And that's, that's true of almost every personal injury case, because in almost every case, the insurance company has infinitely more resources, resources. and resiliency. Mm -hmm. they, can they can lose 20 cases in a row and still turn in a profit. A plaintiff cannot afford to lose one case. And it's the same in family. You know, the multimillionaire wife, husband, whichever partner you want to take. And the other one who was maybe the stay at home parent has zero financial resources. At the end of the day, we know who has more resiliency. We know who has more to lose because the multimillionaire can afford the $2 million payoff to the spouse if that's what a judge orders as a, um, a division of property. But well, the, that's when the, it goes into the system, yeah. uh, you know, as a file, though many family processes, mediation, they don't all go into the system under that construct and that those confines, Absolutely. that framework. So there, there is a, a greater latitude to try to work on the differences to see as opportunities to unpack, to open up as, okay, now that we know this and we're more aware you know, we also talk about disclosure within the family setting, you know, financial disclosure. Of course, there's games that people play. We won't get into all that. It's just trying to navigate this thing. And tonight we did focus on mediation, keeping decision making in your court. What does that really mean to you? Well, it, it means a couple of things. Uh, but just to finish off on that last point, 
it doesn't always mean you have control. Because again, with the scorched earth notion or that analogy, even in the family realm, you can have a wonderfully skilled mediator and you can have one, one spouse, one partner, willing, wanting, begging to get a negotiated settlement. And you can have the other party just folding up their arms and saying no. And because it's a voluntary process, it is 100% their right to say no and not to come to a settlement. Why are they at mediation in the first place if they don't have any intentions? Well, because it's a placeholder, because they can't get to an arbitration until they mediate first, because someone drafted an agreement 20 years ago that said you have to mediate. There are lots of reasons why um, this whole notion of mediation and taking it out of the system is a nice theory, but it doesn't always work in practice. Well, the thing too is with the family matters that navigate to mediation, there's a conscious and intentional and deliberate effort to be more aware of the lived experiences, especially as it relates to intimate partner violence, abuse, uh, control, and power dynamics, mm -hmm. than my experiences from the civil procedures process. Look, in a family, there are remedies. In civil procedure, civil cases, power imbalances are par for the course. And, yeah. you know, if the parties hire you, you are assuming in the civil realm that they want to make decisions themselves. So when you ask about what does this mean to me, the notion of keeping the decision making in your court. Yeah, what's that uh, about? That is... People don't come in front of me unless both sides want to be in front of me. And both sides coming in front of me are saying, whether they mean it or not is another thing, but they're saying, we want to make a decision ourselves. We want you to help us arrive at that decision. And each side is saying all the right buzzwords about we want to voluntarily make a decision rather than having some stranger impose a decision on us. And the system works until you get players who are not being sincere. And the problem is, it's a voluntary system. You have every right not to be sincere, if that makes any sense. In court, you have every right not to be sincere, but there are consequences. You can lose. A judge can impose costs against you if you're being insincere. In mediation, for the most part, you can come there with the worst motives. You can be there just saying, oh yeah, I wanna settle. Let's, let's get together with this wonderful mediator and let's, let's make a decision ourselves and then go in there and completely derail the process intentionally. Why? Because you're playing games and you can afford to play games and you're just that kind of person. And you were lucky enough to hire a lawyer who meshes along with your uh, personality. So, so if, sorry to interject, though, because okay. we don't we have sort of a certain amount of time left, and I really sure. want to get some other points out. If people were presenting to you, came to you, and they said, "Okay, I've got this situation, this circumstance. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to try to get what really ideally I want." How would you try to educate and inform them about mediation and the power of having ownership of decision making? Well, I would tell people that whether you go to mediation or whether you go to court, there's an education process. And when you go in front of a judge or a jury, you're educating the decision maker. And so you go in there and you figure there's a neutral, a judge, who may know nothing about the subject matter. So you spend your time educating a person who's going to make a decision. Mediation is very much the same process, especially if you get a mediator without subject matter expertise, you spend a lot of time educating the mediator to sensitize them as to what your dispute really is, because uh, they may look at it and not understand what it's about. So I, I would tell a person, whether you go mediation or court, education, be prepared to explain what you're doing, why you're doing it, and to treat the person, whether they're a neutral mediator or a neutral evaluator, treat them really as a blank slate. And 
in that respect, the processes are very similar. But I, I would also tell them, look, the, the reality is you're never going to walk out of a court happy. I, I've seen people win and they still don't walk out of court happy mm -hmm. because they take a look. Look, the vast majority of people, when they look at a judge, will see a person who they think doesn't know as much about the case as they do. And as a case goes through, that reinforces it because the judge is sitting there asking questions. So litigants say, yeah, the judge doesn't know anything about this. They may respect the judge, but they don't necessarily have faith that they get it. And if you want to be happy at the end of the process and not feel that a complete stranger has made a wrong decision, then avoid court. But I also tell people mediation doesn't solve all problems either. And if you've got a party who just will not play by the rules, who will not abide by agreements, and we see in the family law field, we see lots of negotiated agreements where one partner or the other, two days after the ink is dry, they're breaching the agreement. Those kinds of people, I hate to label it as people, but there are people who don't respect the ink that they've written with. Mm -hmm sometimes need a judge. So you, you have to get as much information as you can at the beginning from the person who's coming to you and find out which, which forum is likely to give them some sense of closure at the end of it in the sense of whether it's an agreement or a court order that will be lived up to. Um, well, you know, we talked too about the concept of self-determination in mediation where people have the capacity in some way, the ownership, the authority to make their own decisions and thus to live with those yeah. regardless of what the outcome might be. As long as I've been able to make my decision, that's, that's, my, that's my right to do and that's my opportunity. Yeah, and that's important. Look, for self-determination and, and things like that and, and the value of court versus negotiation, yeah. Uh, I hate bringing in politics, but I'll bring in one example, the current former occupant of the White House, who in a campaign promised to release tax returns and spent the next four years not doing it. So a promise meant nothing. And there were ways of getting out of that promise, etc. And ultimately, it took a court to order that those tax returns have to be turned over for there to be compliance with what should have been a simple promise. And that, that's an extreme public example of how some people's words mean nothing. And sometimes you need the authority of a court to get closure. Yeah. And that's, that kind of dynamic doesn't just occur in the world of politics. It occurs in the world of Joe and his fruit market buying mm. Mary's fruit from her wholesale stand. And promises aren't always lived up to. No, it connects with the voluntariness. Yeah. And the, the good faith of people to be actively contributing in a productive manner to help themselves, to help the situation to move on. Alfie, did you want to say anything at this point? I wanted to reframe a little bit what Robert's been saying. I, I think that in mediation... Um, when you talk about how the, the parties educate the mediator about what the case is about, a lot of the time, I think it's a matter of the mediator's skill in getting at what it's really about with their questions and the quality of their questions that does the trick. Because I think a lot of the time, even the parties don't have a real sense of what it's really about for them. And when you ask those questions that get at what's underneath the positions, that's when they hear themselves speaking out loud their own interests and their own fears and their own, you know, what's emotions, what's underneath everything. And that's how a mediator maybe differs from a judge in that they they kind of excavate and and get the parties themselves 
to understand what the dispute is really about. And a lot of the time, the person who seems like they have the more resources or more power um, isn't always the person with more power because it isn't always about money and it isn't always about um, rights. Um, sometimes the, the less um, resourced um, party will be one who has emotional power, um, who knows the buttons to press on the other person, who, who the kids like better, who, you know, has the reputation in the industry that um, can, can ruin the other party. So there are, there are different kinds of power that a mediator can tap into with their questions. And, and I think, that, I think that's the essence, sorry, the essence of the article is that the skill sets that people have as third persons, mediators, mm -hmm. can actually be even more effective and contribute even more so to the quality of the mediation process relative to having that expertise in some way. Yeah. No, there's a lot of truth to that. And look, my experience as a lawyer having mediated with many different mediators um, as counsel for one party or the other, is that there are a lot of different roads to getting to, getting to yes, um, getting to an agreement. And it's not always just skill sets as a mediator or expertise in a subject area. Yeah, you can find good, successful, effective mediators who have different approaches, different skill sets, and that's, that's the wonderful thing about this area, that no matter how many mediators I speak to, I learn from them because they've all got something a little bit different in their toolbox. And sometimes, you know, sometimes something you've heard in passing at a continuing education seminar by some mediator who you thought, oh, I'll never do that kind of case, comes back to haunt you. And all of a sudden, that's a little trick you can pull out that actually helps the parties. So it's a, it's a lot of fun, actually. I can't believe I used the word fun, but, but it is. Well, we, we talked a couple of weeks ago about using humor in the process. It's not about making fun of the process. It's just as a tool, a technique that can help transform a certain moment yes. from the heaviness and the pressure and the anxiety that people have to you know, see it through a different lens and light at that moment. And a lot of us who do use humor, it's about uh, self-effacing humor. Yes. You know, we make fun of ourselves. It's not about the other person or this situation because that could be seen as you're making fun of my situation. Thus, you're making fun of me. And that can be a challenge to navigate, to deal with at that moment. Well, it's, it's, I get this in small claims court all the time. Um, I use, I, tend to be very self-effacing. And for me, it's about humanizing the process because people will look at mediators as holding this power and they do the same with judges and same with lawyers. Yeah. And a lot of self-effacing humor is directed toward humanizing yourself to the point where people do not put you on this pedestal where your power comes from your, your empathy, your conduct, and not from the title. Your and, human skills, your relational skills yeah. to, to be able to present yourself in a human way that someone will understand and appreciate because the empathy is about, you know, hearing a person's perspective, understanding what they're saying, though not taking ownership of their lived experiences. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so what do you want to, what do you want to sort of come up with at this moment to say, hey, about our conversation as we near its end for tonight? It's, um, I think it's sort of mediation in a microcosm because at, after a good mediation, you almost don't want it to end, even though the goal of the mediation is for the process to come to a, a closure. Um, a good conversation is like that too. You find you've learned something, you've improved your own self-awareness in the process, and you look to take that and move forward with it. And I think that's the importance of your show and these kinds of conversations 
Uh, I think the listeners may, or, or viewers when it's Zoom, tune in to learn something. Uh, but I think it's always important to remember that when you're the person deconstructing your own behavior, when you're the person trying to educate someone about what you do, you end up learning more than everyone else because you put yourself under that, that little bit of scrutiny, the microscope, or sometimes you see something really good in what you do because you've explained it and you realize maybe I'm not, you know, with me, the self-effacing part would say, maybe I'm not as dumb as I think I am. Um, well, what people don't know is about before the show started and I'm, I've gotten permission to post on Facebook about the true value of your cat face. <laughs> people will understand that they'll have to go to the Facebook uh, page for a mediation station and understand what that means. Um, how, how do you process when you're with people and you hear the trauma and the deep profound affect on them? How do you process that? How do you navigate with that? Uh, you know, probably the wrong answer is um, you have to build selective walls. And you, one of the walls that's important to build is to always make the distinction that what you're hearing is someone else's experience and it's not your own. And you can't, you can't own other people's trauma. You can't own misconduct of other people's lawyers. You can't own everything in the world. So as a mediator, you have to constantly remind yourself, empathy is not the same as taking on the problems of the world. Empathy is learning to listen well to understand, to be able to validate someone else's experience. And, and sure, look, you hear, I, I did a mediation in December that involved uh, some fatalities, a tragic, tragic case. And how did I navigate it? Um, yeah. I, had to, I had to remind myself that my role was not to shed tears along with the family. My role was to understand the tears shed by the family and to find a way to channel that into a way that the other side of the dispute could understand and relate to in a way that would help advance the interests of the people who were shedding the tears. And it's, a, it's in part uh, an emotional process because you have to be able to understand the emotions of other people. But a lot of it is just training and experience and being able to find techniques or tools of being able to communicate. And communication really is the big word because when you have a family member crying in front of you, they're communicating something to you in a nonverbal fashion. And you need to learn how to understand those nonverbal cues um, in a way that you can translate it into the process itself because tears aren't going to settle the case. Tears are important because they demonstrate a person's interests where they're coming from, their experience. But the tears alone aren't going to get an insurance company to write a big check for, the, for those tears. So a lot, of, a lot of my role in processing and how I navigate is I view myself almost as closed captioning. Um, I'm translating for a different language. Um, tears well, have to be conveyed in legal language. Well, we, we act as conduits yeah. for the energy that's being expressed in the room so that in some way it provides a space and a means for each to hear each other and not take ownership of each other mm -hmm. so that it gives them insight and the capacity to appreciate on some level to then say, okay, it's in our mutual interest to resolve this and agree. And, you know, the, I think one of the films, oddly enough, that meteor, mediators should be forced to watch is uh, a Woody Allen film. And I know he's not a very popular character these days, but it's a film, not a very popular one, uh, called Zelig. Um, and Zelig was the incredible changing man who, no matter where he was, he sort of was a chameleon and fit in with whoever he was in. And I think that's an important model as a mediator. You have to be able to speak the language of the people you're with whichever room you're in, the plaintiff room, defendant room, the husband's room, the children's, whichever, you need to be able to go in there and in a way morph into that mindset, but 
but you also have to be a vacuum. You can't bring too much of your own self into it. You need to create that empty space where people feel that they can express themselves. If, if you're too strong a personality as a mediator, you don't get those feelings expressed. People feel afraid to share because they feel they're going to be suffocated. So there's, for we me, gotta, it's always we, been... Yeah, we got to adapt to our moments, to the situation, yeah. to find what is needed in this moment with these people at this time, with their particular circumstance relative to another set of people, or even within the same process. It's fluid, it's flexible, yeah. and it, it changes at, at, a, at a moment's notice per se. So we have to go with the flow. Uh, in, what, what suggestions can you offer for anyone who is experiencing some type of situation that they have issues with and what mediation can do to contribute in some manner in a positive way? Well, I will tell you, and I hate giving this answer, but it's, it's a truthful answer. We'll be voluntarily with that. Okay. Okay. It's uh, if a person is in a situation that has the distinct odor of a legal issue, I, I really tell people you need to speak to someone who has knowledge. Um, you don't always need a lawyer. There are paralegals who are very knowledgeable. You don't always need a paralegal. Sometimes there are free legal services you can approach for, for information. In the small claims realm, there's, um, and I, it's a Sunday, so my brain isn't processing. I think it's pro bono Ontario or something similar. There are legal services at some small claims court you can consult. If it's yeah, there's, an, a, there's an advice council. Yeah. If in, in family, there are always in family courts, duty counsel available. There's someone you should speak to because sometimes what you think might be a legal problem may not be. And sometimes you just need to speak to someone who's able to characterize legal, non-legal, and give you that little boost of confidence saying, yeah, I hate to tell you, you're in the right place. This is a legal matter. You're probably going to have to file papers on it. Uh, getting advice is a really important first step. And that's true even me as a lawyer. When I've had issues, I've sought outside legal advice. Um, you don't always just rely on your own intuition. Um, if it's something that can be re resolved if it's an interpersonal relationship or some, there are community services as well. There are community-based mediation services that often you don't need to see a lawyer or a paralegal or go to pro bono Ontario. Uh, you can go to people who are in the business of helping mend relationships. And sometimes it doesn't matter what the legalities are. You just need a neutral to sit there and sometimes have you knock a little sense into yourself um, by talking things out and hearing. Yeah, rea things. Reality checking. Last yeah. week we did talk about mediation to reconciliation. Yeah. And I, I just want to bring to light uh, before we close uh, a comment or a commentary. There are resources and supports that mediators can direct to or engage as part of the mediation process. Depending on the imbalance, supports can be put in place such as therapy, legal advice, forensic accounting, business or income evaluators. Basically, some of us see part of our role too is to give people the access to resources or other options in addition to, quote, I've got this concrete, tangible issue. It's, we know it's deeper and broader. There's more impact and effect. It's a little more holistic approach to say, okay, we can help you this way. My background is from community mediation. That was fundamental, that mm -hmm. we would give people re resources, referrals to other situations to help them with the bigger picture. And you know, it's funny because the, the world I inhabit um, of, of mediation is one where people do not come to me without legal counsel. So I've always got that buffer in the sense that part of, it, part of it is I need to know my place, which is litigants have their own legal representation. I can't usurp that function. So for me, referring people to other resources in the world I inhabit 
it would almost be unheard of. Um, and it's a shame because there are times when you see people who aren't always being well served by their counsel, um, even if it's just in that mediation setting, but it's not my place to supplant the, the, the advice they have paid for. And, and it's not to disparage you in any way and come across judgmental. My intention is part of doing that. Yeah. I, I'm in purposeful. I learned a long time ago that it takes the capacity to give people those options, the access to options that I call mm -hmm. it, rather than access to justice, that, the, that it can better equip them to navigate in a more holistic in a deeper, more productive manner into society and community. So we need to, we could talk and talk, which I know I, I, I really feel that we've had a good conversation anyways, from, from my point of view. Um, if anybody out in the, uh, the bleacher seats, you want to present any comment or question at this moment? Yeah, we see somebody's knocking on the window. <laughs> yeah okay go ahead Elfie anybody else in addition and that's not to marginalize you Elfie oh no 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 I was just what was trying to get you to unmute me again because yeah I was having some noise going on over here so I muted myself but I couldn't unmute myself anyway go on yeah, I... yeah no anybody else want <laughs> there should be a feature on zoom <laughs> with, a, with some kind of a knock on a window or door Oh yeah, there you are. Because otherwise, otherwise everything else is quiet and silent. Anyways, anything anybody else want to say? Oh, uh, there's a hand there. Go um, go ahead. Okay, Stephanie. You have to open your. Okay, we have to open your mic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hello, there. hi, good evening. Hi. Hi. Um, I uh, thank you very much, you guys. It's always nice to have you on a Sunday. It makes the Monday and Tuesday, etc., go a little bit smoother. Uh, I find though that this this time of, I guess, for everybody in the, in life, maybe we should start using a pencil and eraser as, as opposed to, uh, you know, having pen ink on everything because it seems like it's changing, ever changing more than it should. And um, and I figured maybe I don't know if that's the right way uh, to look at things, but that's how I feel. So I wanted to see what yeah, what anybody else would think or their opinion on that. Robert, do you want to say anything before we uh, we've gone I mean, over you know time? Yeah. I'm a, I'm a firm believer in pencils and erasers as opposed to ink. Um, <laughs> I, I have to tell you though, there everyone has a different personality, and I think Elfie can vouch for this. I tend to be an ink person. I tend to put down and commit, even okay. if it's wrong, and then go back to it and, and, and change. But I, mm -hmm. I never go into something thinking that it's a process of, I'm going to be changing, it's ever changing. Mm -hmm. At a certain point, I, I'm one of those, do it, commit, put it in ink, and sometimes mm -hmm. live with the consequences. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. I've got a pen in my hair. I mean, a pencil in my hair, but I've got a pen in my hand. So I, I understand completely. So, yeah. so you, you, talk, in my back <laughs> you said, Robert, sorry. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. You said about a pen relative to a pencil. And there's with a pen, it represents to me more permanency. Absolutely. And, you know, in my, in my real life, which is neither law nor mediation nor judging, I like to write. And when I write... There are people who believe in rough drafts and editing. And I sit there and I just spit out 5,000 words and click save at the end and let the chips fall where they, where they may. And that's just who I am as an individual. It's not how I mediate. It's not how I practice law. But my nature is permanency, that you've created something, you've committed to something, and, you know, if it's, if it's wrong, you'll deal with the consequences. And there's all, as a lawyer, you're trained, there's always a way to amend your mistakes or correct them. And if you can't, then that's what you have insurance for. But, uh... <laughs> Elfie, go ahead. Yeah, the difference is if you erase or you use whiteout or a corrective tape, 
or whatever, that's different from like, let's say if you're writing in a, in a, if you're documenting on a hospital chart or whatever, if you mm -hmm. make an error, you have to cross it out, say error and put your initials beside it. Mm -hmm. So the difference is you can't just rub it out or white it out and pretend it didn't happen. You, you acknowledge that you've made an error and you put your initials to it and you acknowledge it happened and then you change it when necessary. Okay. Thank you. I want to be mindful that we've gone over time and Robert's not paid any extra for this. I'm not? Oh, oh I forgot to tell you. <laughs> you know, that's all part of disclosure. Well, well, you know, I did a mediation on Friday and it was a three hour mandatory mediation type of thing, roster rate. So the parties get three hours for $600 flat rate. And it went 11 minutes over and there, that's, I guess, the difference. Some mediators, and I have it in my agreement. I say, if you go over, you pay, and it's, I hate saying this, but it's $350 for each hour over that level, which is industry consistent, but I don't charge for that for 11 minutes over. And so I'm one of those people who believe sometimes you need to put more time in and the, the reward isn't the money that comes to you. The reward isn't getting the job done. And well, you shared with me about you. that earlier before we went on air or view that yeah. really those 11 minutes, what actually happened? That's when people got the resolution. Absolutely. That was the most important 11 minutes right. yeah. in their mind. And yet without the three hours leading up to that, that 11 minutes never would have happened. And it's... And relating this back to small claims court, and Elfie would know about this from her navigating at the small claims court in Toronto, that many times people come into the, you know, when the, uh, they file a claim, it goes to court, then the judge refers them to me do mediation because... At one time, York had a program that did as an option mm -hmm. to assist clients who would file claims to deal, get it off the plate of the, the judge to deal with mediation so that it was off and moved on. So many times people would come into the room with the, the mediators, the student and the supervisor. They might not get resolution at the table. And then we would inform them to say, hey, it's a fluid situation. You got to, you're going back to court now because it didn't get resolved here, though there's always remaining the possibility that you might resolve it before you get before the judge. And so that happens when they're waiting in the hallway for the judge to return from lunch, for example, and they find some reality to say, okay, let's resolve it here. Or when they go right before the judge, they just say, hey, yeah, let's get this off our plate, go home for the day because mm -hmm. it's costing us too much overall. Yeah. Well, it's I didn't let, um, I got into the elevator and I didn't let my parties get onto the elevator. I closed the doors on them. And that's when they, <laughs> was that the case? Were you supervising me on that one, Yodela? I don't recall that uh, elevator mediation process. That wasn't part of the official training. I don't know. Yeah. That's one of my tools. Close the elevator doors. Well, yeah, they talk about the elevator process, so we can <laughs> put it there too. So being mindful, uh, anything else? And we'll just have more editing to do maybe. I don't know. Thank you very a lot much. Of a lot of editing, but... Uh, no, no, actually yeah. minimal. Okay. Yeah, there's more editing that is required when I'm at the radio station. Because True. you got to cut out the, um, for one, the uh, station identification stuff. Yes. And, and this is more fluid and continuous. And it seems that the nuance of people's manner of communicating at the radio is different into a mic relative to through a Zoom format. I don't hear all the heavy breathing as much as uh, <laughs> I do with the radio. Anyways, thank you for all. Thank you. We'll very good. Much. Thank you. Appreciate it. We'll work to get this visual uh, in a productive way to 
present to people for public access, because I think it's a great tool, again, as an opportunity for educating the public about, you know, what's mediation, what's court, what's, what's these things. It's to demystify some of these concepts that people are not fully informed about to help educate them and say, okay, maybe I could work with that, or I know somebody else who could benefit from that. So, and so everybody, you're welcome to, well, if you want to stay, I stay this every week. I, I got to be like the last person in the boat. <laughs> so have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Please tune in next week. We'll have another magical moment as well with our visitor next week, as we've had tonight with Robert. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a good night. You too. Be well.